Uh, we want to continue in the book of Song of Solomon, and we're going to move forward to chapter 4 today. And this is kind of, I don't want to say strange. There's some strange language in it, but it's very uh, romantic. Very romantic. And the king, the shepherd, is extolling the virtues, the beauty of his bride. And so uh, some of it's very self-explanatory, and I'll just leave it be. You know, it, uh, you, you have nice teeth, you have nice hair, and it goes on. But some of it uh, is extremely spiritual in the way it applies to the church, the bride of Christ. And so uh, we want to pay special attention to those things. Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. So if you have a handsome husband or beautiful wife, rejoice, thank God for him or her. Uh, and yet then know one another in the spirit. Know one another as brother and sister in Christ, as friends in the church of Jesus Christ. And, and, and move from there and then apply these verses as Solomon extols the virtues of this Shulamite woman, his bride. Apply these verses as Christ love for his church. In verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. We uh, talked about that. There are several places where the Shulamite woman, the bride, says of her uh, husband to be the king that he has dove's eyes. And he likewise, in several places, says of her that she has dove's eyes. That means they look at things the same way. I'm so grateful when I can see the world and other people around me through the lens of Jesus Christ. And not through the mess of my own stuff. Uh, you and I, uh, try, as, try as we might to be objective, bring the, the uh, twisting and warping presence of sin with our opinions and our own kind of uh, natural proclivities and bents with it. And sometimes God just pulls the curtains back and allows us to look at someone else the same way that He sees them. Through eyes of love, through eyes of grace, through wanting the very best for them, even if there's nothing in it for us. I pray that we see one another as the church here. I pray that we see people in the community, uh, even our neighbors that don't cut their grass often enough, and even people that voted differently than we do, and even uh, people that play for the wrong uh, uh, high school football team, and that we see them through eyes of love, grace, and mercy as Jesus does. There are, uh, then in verse 3, she must wear some nice lipstick. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. Thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. This is, a, a, more than anything, a spiritual application to the believer's mouth. The book of James has almost an entire chapter devoted to the controlling and taming of our tongues. And likewise here, uh, the, the king looks at his bride and says, there's something beautiful, not only about the way your lips appear, but what comes through them. You and I are to have godly and chaste conversations with one another. We're to speak the words of God to one another. And uh, I don't want to get in too much trouble here on the, the difference between the sexes. I'll leave that, I'll leave that to stand-up comedians. They're pretty good at it. But the fact is that uh, men usually get in trouble and regret things that we should have said and didn't. I think most men struggle with speaking up. And you will go back to the Garden of Eden when the devil's having a full-on conversation with Eve and Adam is silent the entire time. Why didn't he speak up and said, no, Eve, God said we could eat freely from all the trees, and God didn't say we couldn't look at that fruit, he said just don't eat it. And devil, by the way, get out of here and quit talking to my wife. Men have, have a hard time speaking up sometimes when we should. Men, or women, or the bride in this case, the Shulamite woman, he says, okay, I know you're going to say things, but I want them to be God's words. I want them to be filled with beauty. I want it to be the, uh, for them to be filled with grace. I want it for them to be filled with love and discretion and wisdom. And if you've ever met a woman who speaks with discretion and wisdom and charity, there's something just amazingly beautiful about it. 
The bride of Christ, his church, is supposed to speak that way, one about the other, as well as about those outside the church, so that they might be attracted to our fellowship and our love. Proverbs 31 extols the virtues or, or, or the uh, characteristics of the virtuous woman. In Proverbs 31 and verse 25, I think it's up on the screen or it's available on the screen. It says, uh, the strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Wisdom is not only knowledge. You have to know stuff to be wise. But to, to be wise is to know how to apply what you know. I could be good at guessing the stock market, but if I don't know don't go and invest, I'm not wise. I could be pretty good at uh, uh, figuring out, uh, say I'm a, a, a talent scout for a baseball team, I might be good at going to high schools and figuring out who's a good major league prospect. But unless I talk to them and recruit them to my school or to my team, I haven't exercised wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. So the first thing for wisdom, you have to know the right stuff. Get the facts straight. Now, I'll never forget uh, Pastor Carl Stevens as I was growing up. He said that the human mind is more powerful than the, the, the greatest computer on earth. And that was true back then. I don't know if it's still true now. It's probably a, 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 almost neck and neck at this point. But the, the human mind is a great computer full of synapses that, that replicate the circuits in a, on a computer board. And if you feed the right information into them, you will likely get the right output. But we need to make sure where we're, getting, where we're getting our information from. Is it from rumors? Is it from hearsay? Is it from someone's opinion? Is it from a news channel? Notice I didn't say which one, because all of them. Or are we getting it from God's Word? God's Word. So you have the right facts input. I'm, I'm reading God's Word, I'm accepting it, I'm assimilating it, I'm chewing on it spiritually and swallowing it and it's becoming part of me, and now I'm getting the right output, that is in my thoughts and in my words, but then do I go out and live it? Do I walk it out? That's wisdom. It's not only knowing the right stuff. Uh, you know, when I was uh, in college and we would work out, uh, uh, at the, uh, the Golds down the street there, there were people in the gym who really knew what they were talking about. But they looked like bowling balls. Uh, they knew the right stuff to have in your diet. They knew the right exercises. They knew how much to lift when. They knew how to get your bench, uh, you know, the weight that you could bench up. They knew how to slim your waist down. They knew how, knew how to work out your abs. But they didn't do it. So they knew all the right stuff, and they would tell us what we were doing wrong, but I never saw them practice anything they said. And so wisdom is living out and applying the right information. And so not only will you think the right thoughts, say the right words, but you will go in God's way. So thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee, and thy word is a light, uh, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. And I remember uh, when I first came to church here, there was a, a paper on the uh, inside of the chapel entrance that said, don't just read the Bible, do what it says. Live wisely. Speak with grace, wisdom, and discretion. You know, sometimes knowing the right thing or the right answer uh, may be the intelligent thing, but knowing that now is not the right time to share it is wisdom. So he loves that she speaks with grace and discretion and charity. Is that the way the church is? When we have visitors, are they welcomed? And on the right terms. Not because it's a politician or a businessman or a great entertainer in our community. Are they welcomed with the love of Jesus Christ that they are a soul for whom he died on the cross? And do we accept and welcome one another with 
with that same love and grace. And that is uh, verse 4, like a tower of David building for an armory. We're on, they're on the thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Now you don't usually tell someone this uh, as a compliment, but she has a thick neck. She is strong. She is solid. She is a strong foundation upon which these things can be hung. And this speaks to her strength. This speaks to her work. This speaks to her efforts. There was a time when I'd, I'd say that my grandmother uh, was probably more of a man than most men are today. She grew up in the Depression. She grew, grew up during World War II. She sacrificed. They, they lived with little when she was young. And she learned how to do much with little. And she took care of my mother's family. As, and, and my grandfather was a preacher and uh, kind of traveled from church to church and didn't make a lot of money. And she worked overnights as a nurse and took care of the family during the day. And there is something about her uh, in, in her work, in her diligence, in her sacrifice that she made for others that gave her a, a strength. And you just knew it when you met her. And so the church is called to be strong. We're not supposed to prance in here like a bunch of ballerinas. We're supposed to know we're coming to encounter the risen and living Christ and represent him to one another and sometimes buckle down and get some work done. I'm so thankful for the people, uh, the Sunday school classes and the people who have been working in our church over the last several months to get it to where it is today. But that's not the only kind of work uh, that can be done, of course structural, of course physical, but then there's spiritual work. You're supposed to win people to Christ. You're supposed to go out and evangelize. You're supposed to go out and share the gospel uh, with wisdom, grace, discretion, and uh, charity, however you're supposed to share it. And so the church today, uh, what there are some studies done, uh, and it's not true here, thank God. We have great families where fathers are very uh, heavily involved in the families spiritually as well as taking care of providing for their physical needs. However, I remember in the, the Presbyterian church in Florida that we were at, and that's typical of many churches today, uh, it was probably 60 to 70 percent women and children, and the dads were there, like the dads were at home, but they didn't come to church. And you said, how is the husband supposed to be the head of the household when he won't even lead his family to church on Sunday? And so uh, the, the, there are studies that were done as to why men have lost interest in the church. And they came to find out that a turning point in American history was during the Civil War. When all the men were at war, marching to battle, the women and children were back in the church, and, of course, they were the ones that were doing all the work. They were doing the evangelism and winning the people to Christ. They were singing God's praises every Sunday. Uh, they were teaching Sunday school classes. And while the men were at war, the women and children were taking care of the church, keeping the church. And something happened in that transition. And they said that uh, the, the, the hymns became less militant. You know, instead of uh, onward Christian soldiers, we started getting songs about the, the planets and the stars. And I'm not against all of that. I'm just saying that there was a, a shift that happened where instead of being a battle-hardened and war-ready congregation, the church became kind of soft. And so when men came back to the church after the Civil War in the United States, it wasn't exactly the same as when they had left. And so uh, since then, historically, men have been dropping out of church. Now, if... if Say, I feel more like a man with a rifle and sitting in a deer stand on Sunday morning than I do in church. Okay, I get that. Part of being a man is doing the right thing no matter how you feel. And the other part is, how about we become more militant and battle-ready as a church? How about we become stronger in our faith? How about we become more willing to take chances to... Uh, to, to share the gospel with people, to confront people with sin, to invite them to repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. So the church can be that, uh, that military company that rides back with Jesus when he returns and establishes his kingdom on earth. But there is strength in her neck. She works hard. She's out in the sun all day. That's why her, her, her cheeks are rosy and her temples are red. It's not from makeup. It's from being healthy 
and being strong. Uh, verse 5 is just, as far as I'm concerned, goofy, but he loves his wife and thinks she's beautiful. Uh, then, in verse 7, chapter 4, verse 7, Thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Can any of us say that we woke up this morning spotless? Spiritually speaking, there was not an errant thought in my mind the time I rolled out of bed until I came to church this morning. There was not one ill-advised word that escaped my lips this entire day so far, nor will there be the rest of the day. He says, she's without spot. That takes us to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So who does the washing? Jesus. How does he do it? By the water? That's the spirit. By the word. That's his book. That's this Bible. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's a future occasion. If Christ took you and me to heaven right now, would we be without spot or wrinkle? So in the future, there's going to be a time when he presents us to himself, and there are no errant thoughts. There are no ill-advised words, and there are no missteps on our part. We think, say, and do everything exactly as Jesus would do it if it were him. That's future. And yet, Solomon in, in chapter 4 and verse 7 of Song of Solomon looks at his bride and says, she's that way now. When you get scared of God's standards and how false far short you and I fall of them, remember that he's not looking at us as we are now, he's looking at us as we will be. And that's why the scripture says that salvation is not a matter of being finished. Salvation, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, is a matter of agreeing to let him start. And he'll take it from there. Now the bad news is he will take it from there. It's like we're kind of cars that he bought out of the junkyard, and he shows a picture of, say, a fully restored uh, 64 Shelby. I don't even know if they had Shelby's in 64, but, uh, you know, Eleanor from Gone in 60 Seconds. And right now, it's a compressed heap of metal, but it's someday in the future, it's going to look fully restored exactly as it came out of the factory. And there, there's a long, painstaking process of of pulling dents and of sanding and painting metal and of uh, fixing the frame and of putting transmission and engine back together and lubricating the chassis and changing all the fluids and new paint, new chrome, everything. There's a long painstaking process of sanctification for the believer, but he says, if you allow me to begin the work, I will finish it. But Christian, those of us who are works in progress, remember with fear and trembling that he will finish it. Those uh, sins and uh, habits that I might hold dear today that don't belong in a believer's life, he's going to get them gone. Now, remember that with fear and trembling, and then as you remember how far short of God's holiness and righteousness and perfection you come, remember with joy and thanksgiving that he sees us as a finished product already. And the scripture says, it is the goodness of God that leads thee to repentance. So when I look in this book, it says it's like a mirror. And I look in the book and I see that my thoughts aren't always captive to Christ. And I see that my, uh, the things that I uh, sometimes hold more precious to myself than even my beloved Savior. And I see the things, the conversations that I have that are not befitting a child of God. And then I see that God looks at me as if, those things didn't exist. And then I say, Lord, let's make your vision of me a reality. It's the goodness of God that leads, to, that leads us to repentance. 
God could sit here and hit us over the head with everything we do wrong every day, and it wouldn't make a bit of difference until we knew how much he loved us, and that his power is effectual to work out his image in us. It will get done. Then we can safely say, Lord, this is disgusting, but you've got the blood, you've got the water, you've got the word. Wash me and help me to be more like you. What, what an amazing process of growing into Christ's likeness. It's, I'm so thankful for his patience. I'm so thankful for, for his promise. And yet I'm scared of the process of the things that I love, that I know God hates, coming out of me, being cleaned, being washed away, being transformed in my life. It's, it's a fearsome thing to be a child of God, but I tell you what, it's much better than the alternative. Then he says, again in verse 11, Thy lips on my spouse drop as in honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue. The smell of thy garments like the smell of leaven. He says, I love what you say. There's one of my, I think it's my favorite line from that old movie, The Ten Commandments. It's when Moses meets Zipporah, and they discuss the uh, impending fact that they might decide to marry one another. And Zipporah compares herself to the Egyptian women, and she says, me and my sister's lips are not perfumed, but they speak the truth. I'd much rather have a woman or a, a woman that's not made up, but has the image of Christ in her than one that is made up and uh, lacks that. Then finally in <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 15, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and a stream and streams of Lebanon. He's talking about his bride. Uh, so I should begin in verse 12. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphor and spikered, spikered with saffron, calumus and cinnamon, with all trees of fragrance, myrrh and aloes and all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. I love this uh, verse uh, in uh, 12. Garden encloses my sister, my spouse. There is a intimacy that ought to happen between husbands and wives. Not only the romance, of course, the, the flutters and the butterflies that happen when we fall in love with someone, but a depth of love that transcends the faults in one another. Kind of like family does. We sit around the table with each other and you know, Uncle Jim's kind of weird, and uh, this cousin talks too much, and this one eats too much, and you know, you know everything wrong with each other, and yet you love each other unconditionally, would give yourself uh, for, for them. And that ought to be the case between husbands and wives. We were leaving a dinner last night, and as uh, I tried to be patient in the parking lot, there was an elderly couple crossing the, the the path that I wanted to drive to get to their car. And the husband was pretty close to lame, but wasn't using a cane or a walker. He was using his wife to support him and help him get safely across. And I thought, God, thank you for stopping me and allowing me to see what a long life of Christian love looks like. It ought to be the case between husbands and wives. It ought to be the case just between believers and the church. And in verse 15, she is a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and those are for Christ's enjoyment only. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 15. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 15. Drink waters out of thy own cistern and running waters out of thy own well. Let the fountains be dispersed abroad and the rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoiced with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind and pleasant row. And he says uh, in verse 20, why will, why will you be ravaged with a strange woman? This entire passage is talking about fidelity in marriage. There are things that husbands and wives only should share with one another and no one else should get to see or hear about or experience. And likewise in our relationship with Christ, he needs to be central, most precious, 
And our intimacy of mind, heart, and spirit needs to be preeminent with Him and no one else. He didn't fix us up and clean us up and change us and transform us to share us with the world, the flesh, and the devil. The old you is disgusting. Allow Him to keep putting it on the cross and putting it to death. The world as a whole is disgusting. Full of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we know the devil is only here to kill and destroy. Don't share the good things that God has put in you through the image of Christ when you were born again with anyone but Christ and one another as the body of Christ. Just make sure that the best of you, the most precious of you, the most valuable of you is for Christ and Him only. Invite the music team forward to close us in worship. If you'd like to be prayed with or prayed to God on your own, come forward.